Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. This evening, friends, we have a very serious broadcast uh, in regards to Damascus. I do believe, and I think we're going to share with you this evening some very uh, troubling facts that it seems to be inevitable that the U.S. will lead a coalition to do a strike on Damascus in the very near coming whether it be days, weeks, hours, I am not sure when it'll take place. But after looking at a couple of headlines that, are, that have just come out, uh, I am more convinced now than ever before that they are about to indeed do a strike. One of the most uh, uh, compelling headlines here, as I have here on the Indian Express, Russia broke a Syria deal, does not respect U.S. leaders, Donald Trump states in a statement. Uh, this just came out hours ago. It was published here on October the 5th today. Uh, but it is troubling to hear Donald Trump saying this, a man who has backed uh, President Putin, who has also likened in him into, uh, as, as a greater leader than that of President Barack Obama. But now he's taking a different tone. Russia, Russia broke Syria deal. And he's talking about how that the United States has walked away from the talks, the talks that they were having for a ceasefire. But in fact, if we look at the evidence, we know it was not Russia that broke the ceasefire agreement. In fact, it was the United States that broke it three days in, not, not even the full seven days, as we even find in the secret revealed uh, tape that was recorded of John Kerry where he met with Syrians in New York City. Uh, that, re that stated in there that he didn't want a three-day uh, no-fly zone over Syria, but a seven-day, and that would be no one would be flying. Uh, and of course, the United States struck the Syrian army. Uh, admittedly, they claimed that it was a mistake. Uh, the British also have claimed that they were part of the coalition that struck them. They admittedly as well say it was a mistake. They were not intending to do so. But nonetheless, they still were striking a target when there was supposed to be a ceasefire and no flights whatsoever. The document has been leaked uh, that uh, Russia wanted it to be public. The U.S. did not want it public because the U.S. did not want anyone to know that they had broke the ceasefire themselves. Of course, both sides have admitted that there were uh, violations in the ceasefire, the Al-Nursa, the Al-Qaeda, uh, the moderate rebel groups, whatever you have, um, uh, had broken the ceasefire. Of course, the Syrian army also returning fire as well as the ceasefire was broken. We were there overlooking Damascus and also the surrounding little small towns around Damascus the day that it broke on the east, on the north, and even on the southern side. One thing I did not bring to your attention already, Damascus practically surrounded by opposition groups. I'll call them opposition because there's so many different groups. We don't know who's who. Uh, and today earlier, I listened to the uh, U.S. State Department, John Kirby, speaking uh, about when he's, when he's cornered by RT's uh, own representative there. Uh, RT's reporter asked him what his comments and thoughts were based on the leaked footage of John Kerry uh, and, and the of course, uh, or actually she asked him a different question to start with uh, about uh, why did John Kerry change his stance when it comes to Syria? Uh, because, uh, of course, John Kirby was saying that the entire time they have been trying to do diplomacy. And, of course, RT's correspondent makes the statement that not according to the leaked uh, recording of John Kerry, where he stated that he had fought from 2013 for the use of force. Of course, that, could, that took John Kirby by surprise, uh, and he said he would not comment on a leaked uh, uh, audio recording that was not done at the permission of John Kerry. But nonetheless, it was egg in the face of John Kirby uh, for stating that they had always been for diplomacy when John Kerry himself, the Secretary of State for President Barack Obama, has stated he has fought for the use of forces since 2013. Now, we're going to be playing you a little bit of the clips of this here in just a moment. Uh, that's been made public already. Uh, thanks to Brother Steve, a uh, uh, brother that, uh, we, that, that helped us to get, get a hold of this information as well. Uh, and also, as I stated, we are seeing headlines that are very disturbing, as this one here with Donald Trump. Donald Trump making the change in his stance for a uh, for or saying that Russia broke the Syria deal and said that they do not respect 
U.S. leaders. It seems that Donald Trump has been briefed without question that the U.S.-led coalition is probably preparing that strike for sure. It's the only reason why I can see Donald Trump would make this change in his stance. Uh, Mike Pence and the uh, debate with, uh, with uh, Hillary's uh, running mate, uh, Mr. Kane, also took a stronger stance against Russia during the debate, calling uh, President Putin the little man. Uh, but just very, uh, very change of strategy in the Trump campaign, and I suppose they're trying to do this so they don't look anti-American. But the, the, the facts are what we're what these men are being fed is the lying propaganda that is coming from the U.S.-backed media. Uh, like George Soros, who's been involved in a lot of different things that have happened in America, but we're now going to deal on our end with what's going on in Syria. Um, let me just show you some of the more things here. So the Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump said on Tuesday that Russia broke the deal with the United States for a ceasefire in Syria and that the country did not respect U.S. leaders. Russia did not break the deal. And, you know, I still know it's up in the air whether or not Russia or Syria won attack the UN peace convoy. They both adamantly deny it. Maybe they did. I can't say they didn't, and neither can I say that the U.S. did either. Uh, I thought personally it was strange that Russia pulled away when it got into the, uh, the Aleppo area where it was supposed to go under that under the control of the United States. Uh, there has been some word that there was also a U.S. drone flying overhead. Why don't they release a video recording of the convoy when the U.S. drone is flying overhead? Uh, of course, Russia said that it could have been it was struck by the drone. Who knows? The point is we're in a dangerous situation. Now, of course, Alex Jones is also reporting U.S. Army chief threatens war with Russia. We will beat you harder than you have ever been beaten before. Now that's, that's pretty much, I mean, you can call it that Mark Miley, uh, General Mark Miley is uh, doing an indirect threat, but that's a pretty direct threat. He says, Army Chief of Staff General Mark Miley warned last night that the United States was ready to destroy its enemies in, in, in comments that were clearly directed at Russia. I want to be clear to those who wish to, to do us harm. The United States military, despite all of our challengers, despite our uh, tempo, despite everything we have been doing, we will stop you and we will beat you harder than you have ever been beaten before. Make no mistake about it, said Miley. The general went on to warn that Russia and other countries had taken advantage of the U.S. being focused on the war on terror. Other countries, Russia, Iran, China, North Korea, went to school on us, he said, adding they studied our doctrine, our tactics, our equipment, our organization, and our training. Uh, our leadership, and in turn, they revised their own doctrines and they rapidly modernized their military to avoid our to to av avoid excuse me uh, avoid our strengths and hopes of defeating us at some point in the future. Now, if we look at what President Putin has been doing over the last course of say the last year or even longer, even before the last year, President Putin has been doing everything he possibly can. He's reached out to the Western leaders. He's reached out to journalists, everything he can to get the world to recognize that, that, that NATO is pushing at Russia in a way that is totally uncalled for. We have seen the maps. NATO has totally encircled the country. Uh, I remember President, or excuse me, um, uh, not President Bush, but uh, former Governor Bush, who was running for president at the time, when he spoke about Russia as well, he said the Russian people are good people. They just need a change of leadership. Um, everyone seems to be against uh, Putin, and yet what has the man done? He goes and stands up for Bashar al-Assad because the United States will not take out ISIS. And you're going to find out in just a moment, as John Kerry put it as well, he knew Daesh uh, or ISIS was overtaking the country, but Russia became the problem. Russia stepped in and changed it all. So yes, indeed, he did know that ISIS was over, going to overrun it, and they were going to use that as a bargaining tool with President Bashar al-Assad. But unfortunately, guys, everything that we've been seeing is nothing but propaganda. Propaganda in the largest way like you've never seen before. Now, we've already played for you uh, in the past here several of the um, uh, different audio and video sessions there of 
peace, uh, U.S. peace um, uh, people, the delegation that went to Syria, um, Mr. Martyr, uh, Henry uh, Lowendorf, all of them, and they've come back and they told us, they have reported to the United Nations that it is nothing but a huge, massive campaign of propaganda to get the U.S. public to believe that Russia and that uh, President Bashar al-Assad demonizing them that they're some evil kind of wicked force. And I realize that Israeli News Live, we're coming to a place, no matter how much we try to join in and expose the lies that we have seen, uh, the fake uh, gas attack, that uh, the sarin gas that was blamed on Bashar al-Assad still spouted off in the media uh, that it was Assad gassing his own people when there has been overwhelming evidence to prove that NATO was very much behind it. Some of the allies of NATO planning, as a great uh, journalist Hirsch, uh, Hershey made the comment there that the plan was already from 2012 to do a gas attack in, on the Syrian people and blame it on Bashar al-Assad to be able to justify a war on Syria. But as we find out later, Kerry clearly identifies that when Putin came in, it was not something that they were expecting. Sounds a lot like Daniel chapter 11, doesn't it? Where I think it's around verse 44, where that king of the north, that suddenly there's tidings from the east and out of the north that trouble him. Well, that was a troubling moment for the Western uh, leaders there when they saw Russia step in to try to help Bashar al-Assad. But as I've stated already, from a prophetic standpoint, Damascus will fall, and that attack is soon to happen. But unfortunately, when Damascus falls, many lives will be lost. Lives of children, women, and I know many people will say, well, Russia's the cause of all these lives being lost. We can go deeper into this even later, but you'd be surprised at how many of these lives are lost, not necessarily because of Russia and Syria, although I agree that they are causing deaths as well. But more of this is being caused by the U.S.-backed rebels, whether it be moderate, al-Nursa, al-Qaeda, ISIS, and them all. They are the ones killing like crazy anyone that doesn't agree with them. It has become a religious war, a Sunni-Shiite war is what this has turned out to be. Let's take a look at some of the things that I wanted to share with you. First off, I want to take you right here. And this is where John Kerry, uh, he is, this is the leaked audio recording of him. He's in New York. He's speaking to some Syrians that are living in the United States. So they've been taken out of the country. No doubt, possibly the people they would like to put in power in Syria once they do away with Bashar al-Assad. So they have their own puppet government set up. Watch what is said here, and I'll pull back to where you can actually hear it. Civil defense teams. We've documented since the start of the Russian uh, intervention in Syria, from day one until February of this uh, year, more than 17 of our Syria civil defense personnel have been killed by Russian strikes. Do you have any videos of the airplanes that have been struck? I don't have any videos. I'm going to have you go to so can I just say, we get a lot of videos of the victims of these attacks that are terrible, but they don't help us. We need videos of the actual aircraft and the munitions. And there's a lot of them on the internet, and we don't know whether they're real or not. So verified videos of the actual aircraft is the most useful thing. Okay. John, John Kerry is actually asking for video. He wants to get video. He said he's been trying to get it for a long time. Then they talk about they have a lot of video that, you know, that appears online, but we cannot authenticate any of it. Uh, they speak about we have a lot of video of victims, uh, but then again, they don't even speak about that being authenticated or anything, but they're wanting video. He's desperate to get video. 
Well, you would think with as many bombs that have been dropped on Aleppo as it is by Russia, and I agree, I do, you know, I'm not saying that the Russian bombs are, are so precision and to per, per, uh, perfect that they're not killing civilians as well. That does happen. I realize that. The United States, the same problem with them, and they have far greater precision in, in, our, in their own uh, bombs as well, but still civilians are killed, especially if the other side is using these people for human shields. Now, in this report tonight, I didn't take the time to put all that together, but I will be trying in the next day or so to be putting more of this evidence together for you that the Syrian people are being used as human shields by those groups that the United States has been backing. But before we go any further, I want to share with you something here. Now, one of the big things we've been seeing in the headlines here recently is being, for example, the destroyed uh, hospitals. There's many hospitals uh, in the region there about uh, Aleppo because it is a very large city in Syria. Uh, but this is another example of the headlines right here. Destroyed and collapsed. The Al-Quds Hospital in East Aleppo receives 46 patients. But it's destroyed. Now this happens to be right here on September the 7th of 2016. Now the hospital in this photo here that they take looks great but it's been destroyed and collapsed. But what doesn't make sense is how many times is the Al-Quds Hospital going to be destroyed? Now don't tell me that they can totally rebuild the hospital all over again uh, just within a couple of months there because according to this article here on April the 28th, just a few months earlier, airstrikes, Syria, airstrikes destroy Aleppo's Al-Quds Hospital killing 14. The second time the hospital's been destroyed, there is no way, it's, like I said, especially during, uh, in, in a war zone area, that you can go in and rebuild the hospital. But you know, the funny thing is, is now after we did this broadcast and pointed it out, not just ourselves, others have point, pointed it out as well. Vanessa Bealey is a journalist that's been working there in Syria for quite some time. She has really uncovered a lot of information and Vanessa has also, in fact, she's the one that pointed it out to me, how many times they destroy the same hospital over and over. But one thing Vanessa pointed out to me, and I don't have it up here, she sent me a message, I was asking us specifically about this. She said, what is going on is underneath those areas where the hospital was, is a systematic tunnel system that is there that is being used by these uh, Al-Qaeda and Al-Nursa and rebels that are there that the United States is backing. Then we find out that they claim that they were re rebuilding the hospital again. Well, all the bombs are being dropped, of course, but this time Russia used a bunker buster that went down and, of course, the media jumped all over that and saying they hit a hospital again. Yes. Again, no doubt, same hospital all over again, but no, what it is, according to what Vanessa Bealey had revealed to us, is that it is where the rebel forces are working underground. This time, Russia, knowing this intel, reached a little deeper, but it wasn't hospitals and doctors as they claim it was. All right, now, let's move on to another issue here. The White Helmets. This is something that in fact, I got an email from a friend there talking about all the things that are going on, the white helmets, the rescue operations, things of this nature here. They anticipate the scale of destruction based on the sound of the plane. This is what a Syrian civilian tasked with uh, pulling people from the rubble have saved 60,000 lives in depressing and devastating work, their head Raid al-Saleh says. Uh, notice what it says in the article here. This was on the, October the 3rd, 2016. These days, Raid al-Saleh doesn't have to see a warplane to know what kind of bomb it drops. He just needs to hear it. It's very depressing, Saleh says. Based on its sound, we can predict the kind of airplane and then anticipate the scale of destruction. He has reached the stage where he hopes for the rumble of a MiG-29 rather than the uh, Su-24. It's the Su-24 that carries the cluster bombs, he states. In a rebel-held uh, uh, Syria, where the Syrian regime and its Russian allies are dropping more bombs than ever before. Now, th if this was really true, and what's being stated in here, and this White Helmets were really truly a wonderful group, then I would have to side with them. 
And I would have to say that Russia and the Syrian government is doing a wicked like never before. But we have had U.S. and British people going into Syria, journalists, independent journalists that have been documenting things that have been going on uh, on the ground right there in Syria, and not only on the ground, but also documenting through the investigative work, uh, through video footage and everything else to show us what is really going on. And the White Helmets, by the way, uh, this is 21st Century Wire, Vanessa Bealey, has done a lot of work in exposing who the White Helmets are. Now there really is a White Helmets group. There is a civil defense group there in Syria that is ran by the Syrian government. And they know full well, as, uh, full well also that this particular White Helmet group that is in here, that is ran by, I suppose, NATO here, is not the real deal. Let's take a look at a little bit of uh, Vanessa's work here. It says, White Helmets. Save Aleppo protest proves how easy it is to dress up actors as war victims. Uh, she shows several pictures here. Let me get this all a little bit bigger for you guys because I know you're going to need to really be able to see this on your screen here. Uh, this is, again, a white helmet person here. This is a staged setup to make it look like it's going to be a victim in this part here. Uh, one of the multi multitude of white helmets promotional images uh, photo on Twitter. All right. Recent protests held across North America and Europe by supporters of armed militias in Syria have staged scenes in western streets eerily similar to those featured in the photos and videos of the U.S. European funded Syrian civil defense, also known as the White Helmets. So they're just showing you how that in this, like in this photo here, you can stage it and make it look real when it's really not. All right. Now, uh, she goes further down. Let me. She goes into a long article about this. Have dust will travel. Another dusty boy this time in Europe. And the popular man carrying the child, white helmet style. Style white helmet style. All right. That's why they carry them. In other words, is what she's saying. But I want to get down to the to to something that's very important right here. The protests staged in European streets far from the Syrian conflict even included children likewise covered in fake dust and blood cradled in the arms of adults posing with dependents, uh, dependent looks upon their faces and also part of the stage scene were actors dressed like the white helmets themselves. Okay. All right, that's what they're showing there. The only difference between admittedly staged scenes in Europe and streets during recent Save Aleppo protest and daily output of the Western created and funded White Helmets acting troop in Syria is that in Syria, the devastation of war provides a much more convincing set for the actors to perform on. All right. Now, let's go to what she's actually speaking about here. This is an editor's note. Here is one such video released by White Helmets and sold to Western audiences as a rescue scene somewhere in rebel-held Syria. Now, I'm going to play the video. I want you to be able to see it. I'll make sure that we get this thing big enough on the screen where you can see this video here. It's very strange when, you, when you're going to see this, see this video because here it is. Supposedly a bomb has dropped concrete all over the place. Should be pretty much crushed or at least beat up and cut up the person that's going to be underneath this. But I want you to watch what comes out. All right. Now, granted, I believe in miracles, so I'm not saying that miracles can't happen, but you're going to see several things here that will only concern you. And also keep in mind, as I share this with you, you got to remember, too, we just had that recent story that broke that uh, there was a media campaign in Iraq that was funded by British and Western uh, governments there over a half billion dollars to make all kinds of propaganda video there out of Iraq during the Iraqi war. What makes us think this is any different? And in a moment, you're going to see some very shocking proof, and I mean some very grotesque proof that what I'm saying is really true and what Ms. Abili is reporting is factual. Watch this right here, this video. <laughs> They're digging for the victim. You can hear a child crying. 
You see the foot of the child now. Now, I wish you didn't. Let me see if I get it to stop right. She's in the center, so everywhere I stop, but you can't see anything. But if you'll know, okay, now you can notice it here. There's not a scratch on this child nowhere. Not a single place. Undoubtedly, they weren't planning on putting her together or anything to make it look fake, you know, or to make it look more realistic. See? The child doesn't look traumatized. All right? There's your famous white helmets there that are supposedly there saving lives. There's always a camera crew involved, as Miss Beely points out, when they're doing these rescues. They've always got a camera crew, and they're the ones that carry them out to make it look like they're the great rescuers. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Now, it's not to say that there's not been attacks there. It's obvious that these places have been blown up, all right? But we're going to go into it a little deeper, guys. You've got to just, just bear with me here. All right? Now that we have here, this is the famous photo that you all know. All right, let me blow it back up. This is a little boy on the ambulance. Now, I'll tell you guys, when I first saw it, I believed it to be real as well. The only thing that kind of stunned me is that the little boy was kind of like speechless, just sitting there, as if there's no big deal. That kind of bothered me, but I just figured, okay, maybe he's in shock, I don't know. Watch what it says here. The following is a collection of high-profile, high-celebrated ce media images attributed to Aleppo and the Syrian opposition used by the Western and Gulf media to call for a humanitarian intervention. All right, and, and John Kerry, by the way, on that secret uh, video there, or, or audio that they recorded him on, says that that's the only way they can justify, and he even states in the video, that, and I played it the other day for you, so you guys already know this, so we don't go back through the entire video, but John Kerry states in there that they now are doing new talks on that issue that they're going to go in based on humanitarian reasons. But as you heard him state on the video just a moment, or the audio clip a moment ago with John Kerry there, there, there was no video footage of Russian planes doing it. Now, not to say that Russia's not been dropping bombs there. We know they have. So are the images being staged? Watch what it says here. Dusty Boy uh, Omran was the August 2016 uh, Western mainstream media poster child for Washington's no-fly zone in Syria. No Western journalist or media outlet dared to question the authenticity of this image. They all simply ran the story at the exact same time with the exact same narrative. All right. Let's see here. Oh, that's just a picture there. All right. I think this is the guy that was following me in the, in the vision. Dusty man. This man apparently for the purpose of the video was meant to be Oman's father. Seen marching behind the dusty boy. Omran during the August photo shoot, he seems to have had the same makeup artist as the young uh, Omran. All right, you have to see CNN's propaganda full. All right, now here's what's very interesting right here. This one got me too when I was looking at this. The dusty lady, the dusty lady image on the left hand side was a big hit in Western media in the summer of 2016. All right, see her there, the dusty lady right here? 2016, she appears in Western media. All right, but it wasn't her first photo shoot. Here she seems to appear in another scene, once again, attributed to Aleppo. And it is the same lady. And if it's not the same lady, I've looked at it very carefully, especially since I'm a photojournalist and I've analyzed many photo documents in my life. The nose is the same on both women. The eyes are the same. The same mouth structure, lip structure, chin structure. Everything is the same. And she just keeps appearing in all these photos. That's interesting. So, now, uh, they show it again in this picture here. 
Another picture, Bloody Lady. Here is a wider shot of the Dusty Lady in the background and what seems like a very interesting application of makeup on the younger Bloody Lady in the foreground at the time. This image played extremely well in Western and Gulf media outlets. And one thing they bring out in the article here as well, though, you never see blood gushing. It's just already smeared there. And if you think about it, too, one thing that's kind of odd, like on this lady here, there's no cut or anything for the blood to run down here. No cut over here for the blood to have ran there. The only apparent injury is just right here on their eye. So how do the, you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it, if you really begin to look at the injuries and then look at the way the blood is, it's not consistent. Now that's not to say that people aren't getting killed in Aleppo. We know they are. So please don't misunderstand me, guys. We know there's a lot of people dying in Aleppo. But why then, if there's a lot of people dying there, why are the photos being staged? Is it because the ones that are dying are actually the people that don't side with the U.S.-backed rebels? I don't know. All right, so that's to give you that right there. Now here's going to come the shocking part. Again, Vanessa Bealey, this was published on October 2nd, 2016, White Helmet Campaign for War, Not Peace, RLA Nobel Peace Prize nomination should be retracted. A prize for the champions of peace, meaning Sutner, IPB, and the movement for peace throughout the Corporation of the Disarmed Brotherhood of Nations as promoted by the Peace uh, Congress, Nobel's letters to Sutner, leave no doubt that this was intention and for the eternity, legally, and binding purpose of the prize. All right? Now, the awakened world is still reeling in shock from the Right Livelihood Award being given to the U.S. and NATO state construct the White Helmets. The White Helmets have been proven to be more than a support network for our NERSA front and associated extremist terrorist groups. In many documented instances, the White Helmets are more than a support group and have been accused of carrying out criminal acts alongside the recognized U.S. coalition armed and funded terrorist factions. Ultimately, the White Helmets contravene all international laws regulated by the behavior of the proclaimed humanitarian NGO. In the following statement that will be presented to the Board of the Right Livelihood Award, I lay out very clear evidence to support my argument that the RLA should be retracted and that the White Helmets Nobel Peace Prize nomination is tra tra travesty of what this prize should represent. And Vanessa Bailey, God bless her for making the stand that she's doing there. Now, let me go down and share with you just some of the reasons why she states this. All right. This is a video documentation of the White Helmets in action. Now, you're going to see, let me just read to you what she says here. There is a video photographic evidence available that clearly shows the White Helmets participating in a nurse up front operations in the areas occupied or taken over by this organization. There is one particularly damning video taken during the Nursa Front violent and brutal attack on Id, uh, Id, Idlib city in March of 2015. In this video, White Helmet operatives are seen clearly beating a Syrian civilian prisoner of Nursa Front and circling the prisoner, mingling with heavily armed and hostile Nursa Front militia. Watch the video. All right, so let's take a look at this video. <laughs> Okay, let me stop it so you can see what's going on here. They've got themselves a captive. He's right in between there. This here is one of your white helmet guys right here. This supposedly is a good guy for NATO. All right, but I want you to watch what he does to the guy that they've captured. Watch what happens here. Oh, that was a pretty good whack, wasn't it? Back it up, look at it again. Yes, he got a good whack on him right there. See, notice the sleeve on there. He's got his little patch and stuff on there showing he's a white helmet group there. Again, let's back it up. Look at it again. He, he comes in there. Let me get a punch in, he must think. No doubt. Well, he got his punch in, but watch, it keeps going.
There, there, now you have two of the white helmets in there. You can barely see, probably not so good on your screen there, but you can see they're there. More, more of the white helmets. Now, let me back up right there where you can see this one guy here as well. Another. Let me back up. There he is, right there. See, you got another one right here. All of the white helmets participating in an attack, a mob, on what? Bashar al-Assad, Syrian fighter. Okay, watch what goes on. Okay, at this point here, friends, listen, you got one here, one over there, another one right in there, one right there, one right here. That right there, that's five that I can see of your white helmets that are participating in a mob on a man. They're not there to rescue the guy. As you saw earlier, they were there to beat, beat the mess out of him just like the rest of them. <laughs> Okay, looky there. We had another good visual right here. Again, white helmets insignia on his back right there. Again, not there for a rescue operation, are they? That's sad, isn't it? Very sad. And they're, they've been recommended for the Peace Prize. <laughs> All right, now you've seen what the white helmets really do. Let's take a look at another one. Now on this one right here, the man that's in the video is a noted member of the white helmets. Okay, they've caught two Syrian army soldiers. States here, various other white helmet operatives have posted videos of torture and execution of Syrian Arab army prisoners to their social media pages with celebratory comments. One such operative, uh, Mawaya Hassan Aga, is alleged to have been sacked for his participation in such executions. However, despite various demands, an official statement has never been issued by the White Helmets to this effect. Neither have they publicly condemned the torture execution of prisoners of war in an act of contravenes at Geneva Conventions. And they do warn that the, the video is graphic in what you're about to see. I'm not going to show you where they end up shooting and killing them. Uh, but one of the White Helmet members, he's taken off his White Helmet, but they knew who he was. Uh, and I, I, I'm assuming it's the man right there in the center of the bus. Uh, they don't speak in here to say which one it is. Let me read also the number six statement here. The White Helmets have been filmed clearing up after the nurse of front execution of civilian prisoners in northern Aleppo. Although the official statement for the White Helmets claimed they arrived after the execution, the spe speed with which they appear in video immediately after the prisoner has been shot in the head demonstrates clearly that they were on the scene and did nothing to prevent it. Okay, here we go. Watch what we get here. <laughs> We won't go into the rest of this. I don't want to go through that, guys. But anyway, the point is, it's very serious. Also, another article here. There's many articles out there. The Wounded Boy in the Orange Seat, another stage white helmet stunt. Now, this here is being reported by Global Research. It states here, the pic making the rounds in Western media together with a tearful story from activists in a neighborhood in Al-Qaeda-occupied East Aleppo. A boy seeming, seemingly wounded sits quietly in a brand new, very well-equipped ambulance at a point 
that touches what looks like a wound to his left temple, he shows no reaction to that touch. The two-minute video also here from which the pic is taken shows the boy being handed from the dart above to some person in a rescue jacket and carried into the ambulance. There he sits quietly unattended while several people take videos and pictures of him. One other kid, not obviously wounded, is then carried uh, to the ambulance. You know, now that's a good point in itself. Here this little boy is supposed to be wounded. His face looks like it's been half ripped off and nobody's there to even care for his wounds. He's in a brand new ambulance and no one's treating this little boy. That just doesn't make sense, does it? These are things, friends, that we don't think about when we're watching this. All we are is we're moved by the image at the moment and we're not thinking about what's going on around the image. We're not taking these things into consideration. All right, so one of the kids, not obviously wounded, is then carried to the ambulance. As the story is told, Mahmoud Roslin, a photojournalist who captured the image, told Associated Press that the emergency workers and journalists tried to help the child identified as a five-year-old Amran uh, Daknesh, along with his parents and his three siblings who are one, six, and eleven years old. We are passing them from the balcony to the other, uh, Roslin said, adding, we sent the younger child immediately to the ambulance, but the eleven-year-old girl waited for her mother to be rescued. Her ankle was pinned beneath the rubble. In an internet search for Muhammad Roslin, the claimed photojournalist finds no other pictures or videos attributed to that name. There were about 15 men standing around the scene and doing nothing next to a just bomb site in a war zone. Another thing to think about. No fear of a double tap strike. At least two more men beside the videographer are taking pictures or videos. It does seem like it's staged, doesn't it? Another kid is carried into the ambulance. In the background, there is someone with a white helmet wearing a shirt of the U.S. U.K. Finance White Helmets Propaganda Group. And an animated wounded man is walked towards the ambulance. Like the boy, the man seems to have been wounded at the upper head. But like the boy, he is not bleeding at all. There is some red colored substance on the face, but no blood is flowing. This is astonishing. When I rode ambulances as a first responder, people with head wounds always bled like stuck pigs. They often messed up the car, which I then had to clean, as WebMD notes. Minor cuts on the head often bleed heavily because the face and scalp have many blood vessels close to the surface of the skin. Although this amount of bleeding may be alarming, many times the injury is not severe. Now I can attest to that from two instances that I know of personally. One, me personally. I've had many falls as a kid growing up. I still remember it like yesterday. I was about five years old, fell off my sister's bike, hit the, back then we had the big rocks in the road. It wasn't just nice smooth asphalt. It hit my face on it. Had to have seven stitches and I gushed blood everywhere. My shirt was soaked in blood. I uh, also remember running into a yucca plant as a little kid, maybe about six years old at the time there, and bled profusely. And I remember when we were in a bad car wreck when I was in second grade, and my sister had glass that just cut her forehead up a little bit, but she bled like unbelievably. We were carried to a hospital in an ambulance and a donut, excuse me, in a donut truck, not an ambulance, but the donut truck acted as the ambulance because my dad is raining really bad. He flags the guy down. We jump in a Krispy Kreme donut truck, race to the hospital, blood everywhere. Um, and that's from a head wound. So they're right. This little bit there is just, it, it raises questions. So and anyway, the amount of the red colored substance, let me back up, minor cuts on the head often bleed, okay, heavily. The amount of the red colored substance on the boy and the man do not correspond to the amount of one who would expect from even a minor head wound. There are no bandages applied or anything else that could have been used to stop an actual head wound from bleeding. Compare the above to this recent picture from a boy in West Aleppo. No Western media showed this boy and his suffering. He is not on our side. The boy suffered a head wound after an impoverished missile from Al-Qaeda and its associated hit his neighborhood. He is, in, he is in care. The bleeding has been stopped. 
The amount of blood on his body soaked his clothes and simply of that scene and the above pictures of blood is also mixed with the other dirt on his face, not painted over. This looks like those patients in my ambulance. This looks real. So just to kind of give you an idea of what they're talking about, you know, and so it does. It, you know, you cannot help but wonder, you know, let me just blow it up big enough for everybody to see this thing here. Well, I can't get it to move over at this point here the way I've got it, so I apologize for that. We looked at this a moment ago, though. The little boy right there. It is just kind of strange. You know, guys, I don't know what to make of it, but one thing I do know. It's getting very dangerous. Dangerous President Pentagon now at the helm of American foreign policy is what Sputnik is reporting. But like I said earlier, if Donald Trump is now stating Russia broke Syrian deal, they must have already let him know they're about to do a strike on the Syrian people. We already know that John Kerry has stated that they're going to take out everything. Let me play you what he said they would do in that video that we have here. If you go to the 35 minute mark here, 35 and 45 seconds. I think people in Washington right now are deeply frustrated as you are. People in Washington are right now deeply about frustrated. What enforcement mechanisms could we now take? And it may be that we will lift up the options because of the frustration, because of Assad's indifference to anything. So there's a different conversation taking place because of what's happened in the last few days. We'll see what happens. A different conversation is taking place in the last few days because of what has happened. But where is the real evidence? There are people dying, as I said. We realize that. But do we have in Syria the same thing that happened in Iraq? And we don't even know the full story of this PR firm from Great Britain who's paid a half billion dollars. Not a half million dollars, a half billion dollars to conduct a propaganda campaign in Iraq. A video propaganda campaign. Is that what's happening in Syria as well? Are we being duped? And we've already come up with so much evidence already. The gassing, the incendiary devices, so much evidence points the other way around. And yet, we're going to go to war against a country based on what? There will be a lot of loss of life then. And the United States knows it. And at this point now, I guess Donald Trump, in order to look like he's a real American, must stand with the President Barack Obama because he knows now that they're going to go to war. As the as Alex Jones brings out in his article there that the general has now threatened and he said they're going to beat him like they've never been beat before. I will agree with one thing. When I looked at the scripture that I've seen on Syria over in Jeremiah's prophecy, God said that the bars of Damascus will be broken. And I think those bars are the missile defense shield that Russia has placed there. Because if there is an overwhelming uh, force of NATO that strikes at that defense shield it can only handle so many missiles coming in. They're going to break. And I think that's the bars that Jeremiah speaks about on Syria. And I think as well as Jeremiah speaks about this here that there is trouble, sorrow on the seas. There's going to be some ships sunk as well. And friends, it may even be our own American people. And that concerns me as well, because I still love my people, I love my country. But I'm concerned about what cost will happen in the long run. I have a lot of family still in America right now, as you do as well. 
And I only pray that even though Damascus will fall, and yes, the U.S.-led coalition will be the one that brings it down, I only pray that this doesn't go further into a nuclear confrontation or a nuclear exchange. Because you have to remember, President Putin said, if he looks like he's going to take a heavy bit of loss, he would revert to nuclear weapons. Let's pray it doesn't. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live for a special broadcast.